You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Television addict! Television addict! Television addict! Uh. Hello, everybody. It's Wednesday. It's time for a brand new edition of TV Guidance Counselor, the show where I talk TV with interesting people. And today there are a few people more interesting than my guest, who is the one and only Mr. Shadow Stevens. Uh, did I mention I'm Ken Reed, by the way? You probably know that if you're a regular listener of the show, but if for some reason you're tuning in for the first time, uh, my name is Ken Reed. I am a stand-up comedian from Boston, Mass., and have been doing TV Guidance Counselor for a few years now, and I am still amazed at the guests that I am able to talk to on this show. Uh, Shadow is uh, a fascinating guy, very smart, had an amazing career, uh, still does, and done an, a bunch of incredible stuff, which we all talk about here. You absolutely know his voice uh, if for some odd reason you don't recognize the name. You've heard him on American Top 40, Hollywood Squares, uh, probably most recently as the announcer on the Craig Ferguson show for about 10 years. Uh, he is also the voice of Antenna TV, which if you are a listener of this show, I am positive you watch uh, frequently. Uh, and a super nice guy, as I said, fascinating career. And as soon as you hear the voice, this guy has the pipes, everybody. I am not a broadcaster, despite doing this podcast. As you can tell, I do not have a radio voice. This guy is the quintessential radio voice. Uh, he's also incredibly funny and and smart, and and I cannot thank him enough for taking the time to sit down and talk with me. I, I really enjoyed this chat. This is this is one of my favorites. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy today's episode of TV Guidance Counselor with my guest, the one and only Shadow Stevens. TV is my friend, and it has been always there for me. Time it's a great honor to welcome my guest, Mr. Shadow Stevens. How are you, sir? Oofta. <laughs> As we say in North Dakota. Yes. Where you grew up, right? You I did. North Dakota. I've never been. Well, you're missing it. <laughs> go in July. Is that the best time yeah, to go? Yeah, July is a good, a good month. Are the, red, the 11 beautiful. months are very snowy, I imagine? Uh, there are a lot of... Um, Chilly days. Yes. I mean, we're in town from Boston. We've been here a week and we've missed three nor'easter storms. Oh, thank so. God. I, I uh, lived in Boston and uh, it has the heaviest snow on earth. So I think it's in the Guinness Book of Records. Yeah. It's actually the, also the windiest city in America. Is it? More yeah. than Chicago. That can't be. I found out that Chicago only got that name because of the politics. Really? It's called for like blowing hot air. It was not actually a, an actual meteorological. I'll tell you, I've been in Chicago in the winter and I've never felt cold like that. I bet. Just like to your bones. <laughs> to the bone. Yeah. When I, I, I did this, uh, I filled in at um, The Loop, which just died a week ago, a uh, legendary rock station. So I went there to do a morning show for a week and it was in January and it was only like 15 degrees. Yeah. It was a thousand below. Oh, I bet. It was, uh, and guys, and, and, and the valet would stand out there with his, um, you know, top coat, <laughs> right. eight hours straight, and I would last 10 minutes. Yeah. Go, oh, oh, I have God, friends I who are like, this. my eyelashes froze together. <laughs> yes, eyelashes, yeah, were free, or break off and yes. fall with a clunk to the floor. But when you were in Boston, was it about 68, 69, around? Um, 69, and... Um, into early 70s. Yes, that was WRKO, I think, right? Yes. Uh, the Big 68, I think that's what they called Yeah. That was, do you... Now radio. Now radio. Now it's uh, right-wing talk radio. Oh, good. <laughs> As all uh, the right rock legacy. stations have come. Um, but I think they were pushing a thing at that time called the Boss Town Sound. Do you recall any of that? I don't remember that. It was MGM was trying a campaign to like make Boston the next San Francisco <laughs> at that time. Oh, really? Which, was, which obviously didn't take. All I remember is May White. Oh, yeah, Maya White. Maya White and Yarai Sarit. <laughs> Yarai Sarit. You know, it's like, what What are you doing? I'd, I'd got to Boston after living in Tucson, which is one of the friendliest places on earth. <laughs> and you go into the Circle K in the morning, hey, good morning. How are you? What would you like? <laughs> and I got to Boston and I went to a, to a cafe and she says, What do you want? <laughs> Coffee? Regular? 
<laughs> and I went, uh, yeah, I'm regular. Why are so, you so, mad so it me? comes with cream and sugar already in it. And it's like, I think I'm in hell. Yeah, I it's want like, the irregular, I guess. It's <laughs> like, um, so if that would be okay, uh, would you yeah. mind so much if I, so then. It's a miserable place. I always joke that I don't, you'd think there wasn't enough shoulders for all the chips, but there's plenty <laughs> there. <laughs> In 68, when Kevin White, there's a, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, there's a documentary called The Night James Brown Saved Boston, and it's about James Brown playing at Boston Garden in 68, the night after Martin Luther King was assassinated. Mm. And Kevin White, had to beg him to go out and make a speech basically to tell people not to riot really and uh and wgbh which was our pbs station scrambled and aired it live because they were like we'll show this show for free so everyone will stay inside mm. which is just insane that is and truly kevin Wright had kevin white had to like put together <clears throat> enough money <laughs> to, he had a what did he call them it was it was like these 12 um old money people that he used to go to when he needed some quick cash you know in true non-corrupt towns <laughs> oh yeah, yeah truly yeah <laughs> uh, so when north dakota, north dakota you grew up and you were doing radio early right weren't you like 10 years old when you started yeah I w I, well i built a little radio station in my house when i was 10 and um, i had a a um i had a wire it was called a wireless broadcaster kit and it was um something I, you had to solder together yeah and i was always good at following directions so i was able to put this together then i took it to the to the tv store where they did tv repair and i asked him how to soup it up right and right. so he he showed me and then he said and it would really help if you put up a big antenna so i strung a hundred foot antenna from the top of our three-story house to uh, um, an evergreen tree in the backyard and i was able to broadcast a mile in every direction <laughs> it was really exciting yeah but how you know I crawled up, I put the wire, you know, you have the wire and it's strung out into the backyard. So I have it between my teeth <laughs> and I have the uh, hammer and a, um, uh, a little hook in my pocket, climbed up from the second story onto the roof of the third story, inched my way to the top, <laughs> crawled along the top, hung over upside down from the from the peak of the third story and hammered in the uh, loop so that I could wire, you know, put the wire in the um, um, insulator. <laughs> and we're probably not scared or thought about it. No, I just thought, well, second. if I'm just careful. Yeah, I got to get this thing. What else am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, is somebody going to do it for me? No. Yeah. But it's so funny how that was, you know, kind of a precursor to your doing like social media. But you had to actually go and ha and put your life in danger to do so. Yeah, you got to do it yourself. And, yeah, and and, 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 I, and to this day, I believe that you know you do it yourself, like you have. You know, yeah. you, you put this together and you learn how to do it, and yeah. don't have to count on anybody because you know as soon as you get another person involved, then they're not available, right? Or they don't come through, or they promise yeah. and they talk a really good game, and they'll get it done for you, but they don't. Yeah. And then you're, you're waiting, and then you're making a note, and then you have to get a hold of them again and say, yeah, we were going to get together on Tuesday, but, you know, I know that thing came up, but in the meantime, uh, you know, when can we uh, schedule a time and we can finish this up, yeah. and then that doesn't happen. That's why I stopped being in bands. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> stand up so much easier. It's just me. <laughs> right. Show up with right. no equipment. But yeah, I'm amazed at how, you know, I worked in radio for, you know, 20 years ago, but everything it took two big studios to do I have with me here, which people can't see, but it's a much smaller amount of equipment. Truly. Um, and Things I, did change yeah, a lot. And you can distribute it uh, <clears throat> right up against, you know, big, huge corporations, and you're right on the virtual shelf next to them. And it's, you know, amazing. I imagine for a kid who was DIYing at 10 years old, that's almost like a science fiction reality come true. It's beyond science fiction. In fact, everything that's happened is, you know, I can't predict anymore, you know, <laughs> what's going to happen, but... You know, I did this um, this radio station for Sammy Hagar uh, some years ago. Cabo Wabo Radio. Cabo Wabo. And even then, at the time, I had this, you know, like what you're recording on, this little um, portable stereo with built-in compressors. Yeah. And I was able to go out into the, you know, thousands of people gathered at the Cabo Wabo Cantina and do live interviews, and it was broadcast quality. Yeah remark and really good crunchy crisp 
good microphones, uh, just remarkable. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, even up until the '80s, they had like backpack recorders and things like that that you had to go out with. You had to be physically strong in yeah. order to kind of go out and do these things, and it, it sort of limited. Like I, I always wonder when people were like, "Oh, it was kind of a man's business," and I'm like, "Yeah, the world was like that." But also, you kind of probably had to be a big dude to go out and haul all this equipment around. Yes, and be like a, a strapping newsman. outdoorsman. <laughs> yeah, I'm hauling twenty hundred to. 200 pounds worth of stuff so you're you bounced around to a bunch of different radio stations and then was this sort of big brick when you landed out here was la sort of the first well but i actually boston was when i finally got it together i was pretty awful <laughs> i had a lot of enthusiasm my whole life my 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 best attribute has been my enthusiasm i when i commit it's a hundred percent yeah and i throw myself in and i do everything i can and I have tapes that are laugh out loud funny. What's they're, so bad about them? Oh, they're just terrible. <laughs> I didn't. I hadn't figured out who I was or how to do it. And it was trying to copy the guys back east, whether it was Dick Biondi in Chicago or or uh, Jerry Blavitt in Philadelphia. And guys were really good. Yeah. And I'm this kid. Oh, yeah, yeah. God, it's just <laughs> hilarious. And, the Peter Wolf style stuff. <laughs> yeah, and the, but the, by the time I got to Tucson, I was starting starting to get a little bit better. But by, when I got to Boston, and had really good professionals around me, and then I had to figure it out. Right. And it all came together, and then I did really well there, and that was the beginning. Of you know, and I started doing television at that time, and then uh, you know I was only there a year, and because I got really high ratings, they moved me out to Los Angeles. You were doing TV stuff in Boston. Yeah, I did. Um, there was a legendary television personality named Dave Garraway. Oh yeah, and Dave, uh, you know, had been you know one of the early guys in talk. And he was doing a show uh, called Tempo Boston. Mm -hmm. So they hired me to be the youth correspondent. Okay. <laughs> and I would come on in my three-piece suit and talk about the Beatles, you know, Paul is dead controversy. The happening scene today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and talk about what was going on in music and, and uh, you know, the world of young people. And then they uh, uh, put together a show for me called Gazebo. And it was a, you know, y young kind of um, music oriented yeah. show. And, and I ended up interviewing uh, Steve Miller and, oh, wow. and some, pretty, some pretty impressive people were a part of it. And so by the time I got to Los Angeles, now what's really interesting about that is the guy who, who discovered me for television uh, is a guy named Rick Rosner. And Rick was the producer of the Dave Garraway show. Mm -hmm. And then Rick moved out to Los Angeles, or maybe he already lived here and then did that. I'm not sure. But when I came to Los Angeles and went to KHJ, um, he was then the producer of the Steve Allen show. Oh. The new Steve Allen show. Yeah, yeah. So, who was one of my idols of all time. And we're, if you're talking about, you know, great television. Yeah. The Steve Allen, you know, uh, Tonight Shows were amazing. He was so funny. So Rick has said, said I'm doing this show. We would like to have you be the announcer, you oh, know, wow. the on-camera sidekick. Yeah. Um, so he hired me, and I went on um, completely out of my element. <laughs> I, I w like... Albert Brooks in Broadcast News. Yeah. I sweated like you uh, through <laughs> shirts. You know, they, the the girls would come over. The makeup girls would come over at commercials, and they would be, "Boy, you really sweat." I'm like, "Yeah." I, but, but the truth is, I didn't know what I was doing. I could say, "You know, Steve Allen," and that would be fine as long as I had a script. But I'm just winging it the rest of the time, and I'm looking at my idol, <laughs> who's what I was say. a genius. Yeah. So intimidating! Like the first time you meet him, you're working with him. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And and there I'm sitting in between commercials. He didn't talk to anybody. He would write notes, and this is something I've done since then. Right. He would write as fast as he could write, and I go, "What are you writing?" And he said, "I'm always concerned that I'm going to forget an important thought." 
and I want to make sure that I get it. And so I'm writing whatever is coming to me, whatever is, you know, wherever I'm at. I went, but it's good enough for Steve Allen. It's yeah. good enough for me. <laughs> it's worked well and for you. Really well. <laughs> and I have, I have notebooks now that go on um, since then, since right. the 1970s, you know, with dates and times and, yeah. You know, and thoughts could, and notes and if you ever re, do you revisit them ever and see kind of like start trolling them for something interesting or uh occasionally yeah um it's a long story <laughs> um in the 1970s i started um working on a project that i love that i'm still working on today it's a uh reimagining of the of the 1924 thief of baghdad oh wow with a contemporary soundtrack and um, my son grew up with me doing this, right. and he's more fanatical about it than I am right. today, and he's taken it to a whole new plateau. We're still working on it. It's still amazing. And um, when he visited last Christmas, we went out to storage, and we're going through pulling out Christmas boxes, and I see a box of notebooks. I open the box, and I pick up a random notebook, and I look, and I open it up, and it goes um, October 1975. And I see a note, make Super 8 version of Thief of Baghdad. <laughs> <laughs> and and no, I had remembered, I thought I'd started this like 1978, but yeah. no, there is in my notes. But anyway, so Steve Allen was a, a, um, a major force, and some really funny things happened on that show. Um, we had, um, was his name Peter Circos, or, P or he was a, a mental, a, a psychic. Okay. And, um, and he was very well known, and they had him on. And they say to the panel, uh, does anybody have a gift that was given to them? Uh, you know, a ring, a watch. And I went, well, yes, my watch was given to me by my father. And they go, oh, okay, give it, take that. So I take off my watch, and I give it to him, and... and he holds it up and he go and he goes. Uh, there has been a death in the family. And I went, uh, I know, <laughs> no. Uh, and I really want him to get it right. Yeah, I believe yeah. in this stuff. I'm beaming him mental <laughs> images of you Come know on. who I am Come and my on. whole history and family. And everything he said was wrong. <laughs> and and I'm compulsive about being truthful. So I, I, I know I'm sorry. Uh, no. And he gets very anxious. So pretty soon, in an awkward moment, Steve says, well, let's uh, maybe we should just try someone else. <laughs> right. And, and, uh, and, and um, one of the uh, guests gave him a bracelet, and he got everything right, oh, magically. Magically, yeah. I guess they knew how to play the game. <laughs> and, and afterward, I, I had, because I was young, I, I had befriended all of the, uh, the people who were uh, the valets and yep. you know the guys who would would take you you know from your dressing room to your car? So one of the guys said, "We just took him out to the car, and he hates you. <laughs> he hates you." He says, "That son of a bitch." He says, "I should have told him about the affair that he's having on his wife." Wrong again. <laughs> it was so funny. I was like, no, no. But who would teach you? Like, you wouldn't, you know, you come from North Dakota, you come from radio. Who would teach you that, like, it's standard to just go with the guy? Yeah, right. You know what I right. mean? That's, it's that's like, showbiz. I was, grow, I was grown up good. <laughs> and it's like we learned to be good and honest in North Dakota. <laughs> You also, like, your style is that sort of low and slow, like, big voice style instead of what you had alluded to earlier when you were trying that, like, real happening 60s thing. Well, you know, when I, when, I, when, I, when I got to Boston, I figured out that, um, that projected kind of fast-talking um, energy enthusiasm that was believable. Right. And, and was, was a reflection of me because, you know, then I would come up with these with these odd kind of um wordplay kind right. of thing which is what i like or and it will be um that i and i did this on the steve allen show too because i had done it in, in boston that i had the ability to um to um walk back in time and and so 
he's uh, Steve is interviewing me in front of the audience, and he said, "Well, do you like play guitar or anything?" Well, I, I no, but he said, "Well, what is it uh, that you do?" And I said, "Well, I can um, go backwards in time." <laughs> really? I go, yeah. He couldn't you give us an example. So I stepped away from him, and then I walked toward him, saying, "Hi, Steve. How are you?" <laughs> And then I walked backwards going, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Proto David Lynch. <laughs> and, the, and the audience was like, titter, <laughs> <laughs> awkward, like, what the hell? Right. But now I would do that kind of thing on the radio and learn how to say Shadow Stevens is dead in backwards. So that if you recorded it and played it backwards, you were going, Shadow Stevens. <laughs> Which was contemporary at the time with the at Paul. The, with the, the Paul Paul's dead, exactly. And exactly. it must have been interesting, too, because that bit works well on radio, where it's only audio. Right. But it's hard to translate that stuff sometimes <laughs> to a visual. <laughs> where the, the audience is like, I don't, where did he go? Bro, yeah. What is this? Where Who is what? Was there were there other than Steve Allen when you were growing up? Were there television shows that you watched? Were there shows that you couldn't miss? Or were you a radio guy? Were you like always glued to the radio? Well, we didn't have uh, you know in the little town in North Dakota that I grew up in, we didn't have television until I was uh, maybe ten years old. Wow! Uh, and then it was only one channel, right. and and uh, so we, I grew up with um, Jackie Gleason and Red Skelton, and um, um, uh, what was it? Phil the, uh, Silvers and Sid Caesar. Yeah, and, 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 and I just say here, uh, Captain Kangaroo, oh, yeah. of course, as a, as a child. And, um, and people really sparked you know, my imagination and, and were fun and funny. Usually the funny stuff was... was Although, of course, there is Twilight Zone, yeah, and um, Alfred Hitchcock presents, uh, all of which I loved. In, in radio, there was a show called Suspense that I loved as a child, really spooky, mm-hmm. and I remembered to this day some of the uh, episodes because it was that that you know the imagination in radio. Is what makes it, it it magic. That theater of the mind stuff that yeah. people tend to. And one of my favorite for. things of all, and something that I've done a lot of uh, during my career at different phases. Yeah, I remember even like when you took over American Top Forty, it became more of that stuff. Like where well, American Top Forty, you know, is 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 perplexing because that, that I even got it right because my entire life was built on parody. And being funny and being irreverent, and all of my interest in music was always cutting edge and and um, not anything like American Top Forty. Yeah. So now I had built my reputation um, on radio with starting K Rock here in Los Angeles and KMET, which is the first really uh, financially successful. Alternative rock, uh, not, they weren't alternative, they were classic rock station um, in the country. And then I quit radio and started my production company, and pretty soon I was doing the Federated campaign, which right. is all of these, um, you know, we did 1,100 different commercials. Was that many? Yeah. Wow. It was like a machine. And they were all funny, and they were all like... Um, did you play the characters like Fred R rated was the character? Fred rated and yeah. Freddie Radair and <laughs> it was like all any kind of wordplay that because it was all, all built on making you remember the name Federated. So right. Fred rated for Federated, Fred and Frieda rated for Federated, Fred and Frieda rated, <laughs> and my dog Fear. Everything was alliteration and and things that I could say really fast and and do something unexpected. And so, based on that success, I started getting. Uh, television and acting opportunities. And then I got Hollywood Squares, which yes. was Rick Rosner. Okay. Rick Rosner comes back from doing the um, Steve Allen show. And now, how many, what was it, 15 years later? Yeah. Uh, almost. Um, he called me and said, I want, I'm going to do a, a pilot for bringing back Hollywood Squares. Would you be the announcer? And I went, sure. So I did the announcer. And then, he wanted me to be the regular announcer on the show. And I went, 
No. I don't, you uh, know, I have a shot at acting. I have a shot at performing. And that's where I want, if I do announcing, I'll be the announcer. Right. So I turned him down and I, and I, and I was hired to do this movie, Tracks. Oh, yeah. And I had a three-picture deal with Dino De Laurentiis and it was looking really exciting and I was, you know, enthused about that. So Rick, you know, kept calling me and said, no, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. And I turned him down three times. The fourth time, he said, I tell you what, what if we put you in a square and you do it from the square? You do the announcing from the square and uh, you can promote whatever it is you're working on. Festival? You track, oh, and, and if you have to go away to do a movie, then so be it. You'll be gone for a while and we'll get somebody to sit in. Fine. So then the unexpected happened. And it was... Uh, hugely successful like the biggest show of the year yeah that that relaunch did you watch the original because it was i mean probably not aimed at you when it was on originally. well yeah well yeah of course it was funny yeah. uh, it wasn't you know youthful and cutting edge yeah. but it was funny and and i always enjoyed it and but rick had a new angle on it and it was uh very fun and and exciting and clever and uh, Joan Rivers was the center square. I mean, yeah. how, how can you beat that? So, um, so that got really successful. And then along comes the opportunity to do American Top 40. And I thought, well, this is the greatest gig in the world. I've got to try. And 1,100 people, including major stars, uh, auditioned wow. to do that. And I, uh, because of my radio background, I think, and the fact that I was kind of the Ryan Seacrest of the moment, um, they gave it to me. Now I'm I'm going to do Casey Kasem, who's the most earnest, yes, <laughs> sweetest man on earth, 180 degrees opposite of everything I am. <laughs> and the and you know so I come up I say well you've got to we got to do some theater of the mind because we're kicking this off. Oh, and by the way, when we kicked it off, this is the greatest thing ever. There was a great big party in Washington, D.C. to launch me doing American Top 40. Why D.C.? Um, I don't know. Well, maybe America. They're looking at like the heart of... Uh, it, it, was weird. A, it was yeah. a really big deal and yeah. a, big, uh, uh, a big party and, and celebration, the launch, the announcement. And they said, uh, we want to hire a rock band to um, be the entertainment for the night. And I said... Sam Kinison. <laughs> we actually had Sam Kinison. Doing and a wild he was thing. out of his mind. Yeah. He was a lunatic. And I loved Sam. He was he was he was a, a friend of mine and <laughs> and uh, This is like a height of Sam Kinison. The height of his lunacy yeah. and, and and his band was really loud. Yeah. And he loved it and he loved being just completely insane and he was driving people out of the room. <laughs> That's the <laughs> and I thought dream. it was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my <laughs> yeah. life. And and so then I do the show and I try to do, you know, the the same staff, the same producing team, the same writers were all there and they had, had written the script. And it's written for Casey's mouth. Yeah. Coming up, I could not do it. Yeah. I could not do it. It was awful. So we it, it took 18 hours to do the first four-hour show. Wow. We rewrote every sentence, and we had to, to find my tone. But, it, but you know, they were anxious because he was an institution, and how am I ever going to fit into Casey's shoes? So, you know, I, for years I had signed off every show saying, and until we meet again, it's your friend in the void, the shadow. So they said, wait, void? What is void? <laughs> what? It's like spooky. It's, it's kind of like, dark. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's the infinite unknown. It is all that is. It's the universe. It is, you know, the dimension where it's all a possibility. <laughs> it's what well, you know, it makes people feel anxious. You know, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, we, uh, we, uh, we don't want you to do that. We so. need a new keep your f feet on the ground. Yeah. And <laughs> well, I did that too. Um, so I changed it to your best friend. It's like, oh God, your best friend, the shadow. 
So, so Casey had always done keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. I mean, that's the most earnest, saccharine, you know. I loved Casey, but yeah. God damn. <laughs> I could it's not. A different tone. I could yeah. not do that. So I would come up with things like, um, and remember, the world is your oyster, and if you can't find your pearl, you can always have lunch. <laughs> and, and it would be like something like that, yeah. always. And and you know, finally finding a tone that was somewhere between earnest and a little bit tongue in cheek. Yeah. And. Um, it, and it became wildly successful, you know, it went, went all over the world. And for the next seven years, they flew us all over the world to promote it. And we were in, we were in uh, Tokyo, and we were in Hong Kong, and we were in Norway, and Bali, and, you know, everywhere. And was that the first time you'd been to a lot of those places? Oh, yeah. I imagine? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bring you yeah, out Yeah, it there. was fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it was huge. And I, <clears throat> I had mostly known you, your voice, from Kentucky Fried Movie. Oh right! And I oh, mean, that's God. kind of everything you. That's a good story too. I got to tell oh, you that yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was produced by a guy named um, Bob Weiss, and he introduced me to the team. Um, he had been um, friends when I had my production company, and the production company was set out to do radio commercials and uh, radio shows. Mm -hmm. That's when I left radio. I had quit in a rage for the third station that <laughs> I had been made number one and they started fucking with me and I, yeah. said, I couldn't deal with the politics. I'm saying, okay, I'm done. Radio's if I'm going to work this them. hard, I'm going to go for bigger stakes. So I started this production company. It was very difficult, but along the way, we started building some momentum and they brought in these young guys, the Zucker brothers and Jim Abrams and they had this wonderful movie they were doing the kentucky fried movie and they wanted me to do some voiceovers for it and it was like i love this stuff it was so much fun so then they hired me to do the whole advertising campaign for it which i did and it won awards the big apple award in new york and and uh, it was very successful and afterward they came to me and they said we love writing with you it, it was so much fun. We're going to start another project. And we thought we'd get together a couple of times a week and see what happens. Yeah. And I thought about it. I thought, well, these guys have been together th since college. There's three of them. And there's me. I'll be like the fourth wheel. And so it's like, this doesn't work. And so I turned them down. Of course. And they, um, they go, okay, well, we understand. And they got together. And a year later, they came back to me. And they, um, they said, we'd like to hire you to do the, the voice of the presentation we're doing for Paramount for our new project called Airplane. Went, so they paid me $300, and I did Airplane, and they all became wildly legendary. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that movie was enormous. It was... Kentucky Fried Movie was still sort of an indie movie and it was culty. Yeah. But Airplane was the first time people got that Mad Magazine humor they grew up with in a movie, and everyone went, Nuts and it was brilliantly yeah. done. It's like moment to moment, line by line. It was so good, and I kicked myself a million <laughs> times. Like, oh my god! You know the things that happen in your life that that are pivotal, and you can't do anything about it. It just yeah. it makes a good story. You know, I did this whole series of art. You know, I have this website shadowart.com. Uh, that has all my a lot of my artwork, and I did this series uh, called the Transdimensional Symbolism of Rocky Waters. Rocky Waters meaning difficult times, a right. metaphor. And in the first piece, it was just when he thought he was winning the game, fate took a turn down a blind alley, and suddenly he was forced to confront fear, doubt, and change. This is the story of my life. Yeah. When I was at KRLA, when I first came out to Los Angeles, I was winning the game at KHJ. But then when it came time for the promotion that I was in my contract to get, they didn't give it to me. So I quit. And I was hired by the competition, KRLA. And KRLA uh, brought me over, put me on in the afternoons, drive time. And within a few months, they, they made me program director. And then we killed. We... we got huge ratings, beat KHJ. And along the way, 
I was hired to be the host of a new television series for NBC called The Midnight Special. Oh, yeah. And I had a contract, and I didn't tell the general manager until I, it was real. Yeah. Because I don't think, that oh, no. eh, may or may not happen. You know, they're doing the pilot on Friday. When I'm in the studio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so um, on, on um, Thursday, before we're supposed to shoot the pilot, I'm excited. I've got the actual papers. Good news. I go into the general manager and I say, good news. I'm going to be the host of an NBC television show about music with live performances. It's really fantastic. And he said, I think you've got to make a decision about who butters your bread. Oh. <laughs> now, are you a radio guy or are you television? You should make up your mind. I know you've got a family to support. Well, God damn. Yeah. So I, I, I was afraid and I turned it down. And that night, Thursday night, they hired Wolfman, Wolfman Jack. Jack yeah. <laughs> and he Who goes on for the next 10 years. From you. Yeah, yeah I mean, truly. It's, it's, it's probably funny to people here, not funny, funny odd to people hearing that now that you, you really couldn't cross uh, platforms at that time. It was, you know, you were movies or television, you were radio or movies, you were radio or TV. Once you transitioned to one or the other, they were like, you're in that world now, you can't come back. Like, it was very, very siloed. Apparently, although there were exceptions to that rule. Yes, um, Dick Clark. But, but yeah, yeah, like yeah. Dick Clark. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, do you think this might be good because yeah. it's on television and on every show they'll say, and you can hear him every yeah. day on KRLA in Los yeah. Angeles. Um, no, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I, it was, you know, things happen. Yeah. I mean, it, stuff I always, I'm not a big fate, big picture person generally cause I'm a bit of a cynic, but my wife constantly reminds me of this too. She's like, we always end up landing on our feet or like things work out always. If you had taken that thing, you wouldn't have gotten these things that actually ended up being so much better uh, for you for a variety of reasons. So that's very true, and and you know, um, failure uh, is the thing that if you if it doesn't crush you, is the thing that that provides the momentum for you to expand. Yeah, and that's what the whole art series is about. That each piece is like another dimension of his projection of. Oh, this is impossible. I'm losing it until it finally completely falls apart and falls into the abyss, into despair, right. and gives up and then finds the spirit within and has the resurrection. And, uh, and in it, all things are provided for. I've all, you know, because the brain is trying to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> Generally, it looks for what's wrong and makes a list. And it tells that story in a great narration in epic proportions in your brain in mere moments. And, and pretty soon you're crushed by it. And so it's like walking a tightrope with every breath. You've got to be aware that the brain is in defensive mode at all times. Yes. And, and I've done a study about that. And, and it's really interesting how that's proven out like the um the propensity for the brain that it's called um cognitive bias it your, your brain wants to believe what it's predisposed to believe in and then there's negativity bias it gives more weight to negative information than positive information then there's the bandwagon effect and the bandwagon effect is you tend to believe what people around you are believing yeah. and then there's the amygdala and the amygdala is the storehouse for phobias and fears and looking out for the saber-toothed tiger that's right. right around the corner that's imminent is going to tear you away and then then there's the ego and the ego is like entitled and certain that it's right and and it it empowers itself by complaining <laughs> and then there is the risk perception risk perception the ability of the brain to discern what is a really whether it's really some kind of grotesque death right. and 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 the and the great example of that is um everybody's afraid of sharks <laughs> As they should be. As they should be. <laughs> yeah. Except 
that only like one person a year gets right. killed by a shark. 20 people a year are killed by stampeding cattle. Yeah. Or fa- one day I heard was falling air conditioners. Or fall- kill like 120 people a year. That's and so I've never funny. knew it was like, I'm really afraid. Oh, yeah. So stay away from the air conditioners. We need to ban these air conditioners. <laughs> or vending machines. That's the other one. Falling vending machines crush a bunch of people every year trying to get their peanuts that got stuck in the thing. That's it. Yeah. So, so like that being caveman, on guard. Yeah, that caveman survival stuff that is has a has a value, but not when it's completely overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It'll cripple you. And it, uh, one of the things that I, I that I had a weird disconnect with hearing America Top 40 and hearing the Kentucky Fried movie was the sort of very thing that you alluded to is that you had this, you kind of, much like Gary Owens, got that big announcer voice, but weren't totally serious about it. Like you could pull it off, but it was a bit of a parody of that, which no one was really doing. It was like very sincere announcers. Yeah. And so that's what came through on that <clears throat> and and taking over from Casey Kasem, who was that in a lot of ways. Yeah. It was sort of strange. No one in history yeah. has ever been more earnest. Yeah. And I imagine that the hardest thing was probably doing the dedications because some of those are just nuts. <laughs> like they're some of them were, and some of them were very emotional. Yeah. And, and uh, but we we found a way to be able to tell that story, uh, or those stories uh, that worked for me uh, yeah. ultimately, and and it became a you know a favorite part of the show. I was able because of the reality of people's lives and what they would write. Um, I found a way to be able to do it without feeling stupid. Right. Where uh, talking about jumping from number 27 to number 19 this yeah. week is a guy who is yeah. like, oh, God, help me. Yeah. It's difficult. I mean, and yeah, like you were saying from going from like K-Rock and that sort of stuff that, you know, you had Rodney on the rock and Elvira was a, was a DJ there for, you know, you know, this new wave and stuff when you're playing. You we know. put Rodney on the rock. Rodney, I produced a show called The Flow and Eddie Show. Mark Bowman and Howard Kalin, the Turtles, two of the greatest guys in history and incredibly talented. And we, for a number of years, I produced this show, Flo and Eddie by the Fireside on Sunday night. And it was a party. I bet. It was amazing. And, and we would, they would bring in um, boxes of records and I would produce them, and no song ever went longer than maybe 30 or 45 seconds. It was this collage of one thing after another after another. And then the shows were, were um, huge guests. You know, Ringo Starr showed up in the middle of the night one night because he was listening and went, I just had to... You gotta get to, down there. <laughs> yeah, I gotta hear and see where, where this is all coming from. And, um, and Rodney, at the time, this is pre-punk, um, it was glitter mm-hmm. the, during the glitter age and Rodney had this club down on Sunset Boulevard and we discovered Rodney and made him our our glitter correspondent right and he would come in and tell us about the the new groups that, that he was discovering and and he's and he was always terrible yeah. but there was something charming about how terrible he was because he really knew. Yeah. He really had great music taste. It was a reality. You're like, this is a real guy. It's a real yeah. guy. A real guy who wasn't trying to be a radio guy at all and couldn't possibly and had a terrible voice and <laughs> and had trouble articulating. But boy, he had such an ear for music. You had to love him. So we did that for uh, for years. And then uh, when I went back to K-Rock uh, after I'd left and gone to KMET and then quit KMET and then I was out of radio forever and then they wooed me back in. <laughs> and uh, so we hired Rodney back at that time. That was in the late 70s. So tra- you did Tracks, which is a movie I really enjoyed, which again sort of <laughs> managed was, to... That's insane. It managed to... I think a lot of people <clears throat> didn't get that some of it was tongue-in-cheek. Like it was... How could you miss? They Good thought Lord. It was Garbage too, you dump, trash yeah. you kill. Because the, the premise was you were, you were a place by his own rules, kills these... You're a cop who kills, executes. The, well, you know, he's a mercenary at yeah. first, and he just wanted to be the next famous Amos. Get out of the killing yeah, game. Cookies. It's like right away, you go, what yeah. the hell? And he's terrible. He comes up with sushi cookies and... You know puppy swirls yeah he has terrible ideas and runs out of all of his money so in this local town in texas 
they uh, it's overrun by crime, and he goes in and offers himself up as a town tamer. Yeah, you know, take care of all this crime and corruption, and uh, and does so in horrible ways. He just yeah, he really kills violent. people and really, really yeah. violent. He leaves people, uh, you know, on lamp posts, um, uh, you know, uh, hanging by the neck, yeah. dead. And up and down the street, there are dead bad guys. Send him a message. <laughs> but I mean, there were movies at that time that were sincerely doing that, which, you know, all like the Charles Bronson flicks and that Golden Globus sort of canon Reagan era. Like, Yeah, right. this is over yeah. the top, like taking that to the to the next logical extreme. And people were like, oh, no, I, I'm, I'm taking this for the surface level, and I think this is like really too violent. Well, you know, it never, it never really... It, it's like another one. Just when he thought he was winning the game, they took a turn down a blind alley. It was, it was. Um, I got a three picture deal. Yeah, Dino De Laurentiis, a big producer, yeah. good guy, had a great relationship. This is it. The script was funny, and then in the middle of shooting, um, things took a turn for the worst, and um, the writer producer who was an alcoholic good guy but uh, just drank every night and then he would rewrite and he'd come up with even crazier ideas oh, people are gonna love this oh <laughs> it's like no no it's not funny yeah gary stop and then uh, when it was completed uh dino de Laurentiis filed for bankruptcy yeah and so the the um the show was it was hobbled together um they did an edit gary did an edit and it was horrifying. I hated it. And they did another one, and then another one. And uh, it was all embarrassing to me because it was just so badly put together. And Gary got frustrated and went out on a year-long drive, drinking every day and driving all over the country. And they end ultimately, a couple of years later, they found him dead in his car Jeez. underneath a, an overpass somewhere in the... Santa Barbara area. Ooh. I think it was really tragic. The movie was then uh, bought by HBO, who slapped a little, I think, $1,200 soundtrack on it, and easily the worst music in the history of movies. It's real. It's rinky really dink. awful. <laughs> yeah. It's really, really terrible. And uh, and then they they uh, played it on uh, HBO and all and the time. <laughs> quite quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, but, and then, but then people inexplicably loved it. I mean, there's there's this cult following for it that's really funny. I feel like the idea is so strong, and people got savvier by the time it started airing. That especially since we had the show, it always reminded me of that show Sledgehammer a little bit. Yeah, it kind of had that vibe, which so but kind of came out after because it was right. Um, and and I think people were kind of ready for it at that point, and even badly cobbled together with a horrible soundtrack, you could kind of see what the with the germ was there still, and that came through because it was so strong. Well, I went, I went in and edited the whole thing myself. I got a copy of, of the film and cut out everything I hated oh, really? <clears throat> with all the music and put in, you know, dramatic kind of tongue-in-cheek dramatic music, and it and narrowed it down to shorter, funnier, um, no attention span, all the best parts in yeah. in sixty minutes. And it's on YouTube. Oh, I have to watch that. I think then, it's yeah. uh, tracks reimagined or something. You get a remix of it going yeah, there. Yeah, or tracks remix. Yeah. It might be tracks remix. I'll, I'll post a link on the uh, TV guidance counselor site because I've actually never seen that. I'd love to see that. Yeah, you would like it. It it's um, it goes it pro it propels forward and and keeps all the good jokes. So were you? I, I imagine that's going to be kind of a devastating moment when you're again you're like I have this new picture deal and now it's done and the movie that I loved is now not what it was supposed to be. It was devastating. <laughs> yeah. it was like so disappointing. Were you like let's go back in front of the camera and do something else now? Or well, you no. Know, what happened? <clears throat> we my wife and I took a vacation. Um, now I still had my production company, and all the guys were still there, and they were. Um, you know, I left them in charge. So I, I'm, I'm in the aftermath of tracks, still not knowing what the future will be. I'm in Italy, and I call my dad, 
and my dad had gone in and looked at the books on my in my company and he said you've got to come back right now you're like a hundred thousand dollars in debt mm. these guys have kept paying everybody full salary kept everybody on no new businesses come in nobody's done anything and you've got to uh, save the day so we come rushing back and then it was like how to save you know what what was there and letting a few people go the um the guy that i that had introduced me to my wife who ran my music department was uh, a guy named ron artis and ron met her at the bank and and um said you want to come over and see what we're uh, you know what we're doing and and uh she said sure she had some time she's this international model and really cute and so he was like you know being charismatic <laughs> and i walked in the room and it was like <laughs> a bolt of lightning in, in the universe and we're still together um but ron had to be let go because he was one of the last guys i hired and i said here look uh, i'll give you the severance and and um and you can use the studio uh, and we'll split whatever you do if you, you bring in projects and uh, you know have access. And that night he came in and stole ten thousand oh. dollars worth of, of equipment and everything that that had ever been produced for me by him. And I had to threaten him with grand theft, and uh, before I got the equipment back, and. It was uh, deeply difficult times, and then pulled it back together, and we were still doing Federated commercials, and along comes uh, Hollywood Squares. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, Hollywood Squares had started, but it, but it, it took off yeah, all of a huge. sudden. So, Trax was, you know, a disappointment. The problem with the studio was difficult, but all of a sudden, there was Hollywood Squares. And then on the, on the heels of, of the success of Hollywood Squares... Now I'm like known all over the country, and American Top Forty comes along. Yeah, <laughs> so all of those things kind of like plateaued. Everything went from one thing to another, and it was it things got exciting. Yeah, I mean it's unusual that people now hear you and see you, and yeah. again it's it's uh, and you can act, and you're good in front of the camera too, which a lot of radio people are not, uh, and that's unusual, uh, at, especially at that time. So. I imagine you were getting all kinds of projects thrown at you or people trying to woo you or, or hosting music shows probably was probably the first thing people were trying to get you to do, right? There were, there were things that, that were tried and then didn't work out. You yeah. Know, a lot of stuff like yeah. that. And, 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 you know, and even like um, at the peak of American top 40 and Hollywood squares, I was discovered um, by, um, what was his name? He was at Universal, and he wanted, and, and they gave me a development deal, paid me a bunch of money, and they wanted to do a show, and that's where uh, Loose Cannon came from. Oh yeah, from. Max Monroe was it? Max Monroe, yeah. Loose Cannon. It was going to be called Loose Cannon, and then they found out there was a movie coming out named Loose Cannon, so they Dan had to Acker, change the I name. Think, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, it was Max Monroe, Loose Cannon. It's an awkward name. <laughs> but even that, that started, that was another one of those just when he thought he was winning the game. Things were looking really good. They because really promoted that be, show, yeah. Yeah, it was going to be a big show. And um, in the middle of it, Fred Silverman, the producer, legendary. Oh, yeah. Nobody has ever been bigger than Fred Silverman. And his whole team that had had nothing but success with one series after another. Was He's the, running the whole thing. Was this ABC at the time? Was he over this is CBS. CBS, okay. Um, and he had a heart attack in the middle of production. Jeez. And he was out. He wasn't involved in any of the negotiations, any of the development, any of the deals with the network. And they uh, stuck us on, and, and, and it was actually it had really good moments. It, it could it's have a developed into a, a, a phenomenal show. And um, Bruce Young was this, like sidekick. We were, it was kind of a lethal weapon, yeah, kind of thing. Very much like what they're doing on Fox now, successfully. Yeah, um, but this was 1990, and um, and again, you know, it went seven episodes, um, like one two hour, and that was it. I think that that comedy action, tongue in cheek action 
while still being an action show without being so overly comedic or sort of juvenile, people didn't weren't it was ahead of its time. Like it wasn't until probably maybe later. or just maybe you know it was not supposed to happen for whatever <laughs> right. reason, right. You, you know, because there were ex- there are exceptions to that. True, I mean, it just depends on who's involved and and what fate has in store for you that that propels you right to have a moment of glory or not right and in this case it was not it was a not <laughs> and then it was after you've had a failed series oh you're toxic after that That's right? it. yeah i mean nobody wanted to to give me auditions and and it was uh, a, a while before dave's world was came it along 94 was dave's world no that was uh, i think it was 92 it was, it was right after Night Court ended, which ended in 92. So, yeah, it might have been the 93 season it started airing. Yeah. Uh, it was opposite the John Larroquette show as well, which was the other Night Court alum show. Right, right. In the George uh, Wendt show, which, because Cheers had just ended. That's true. Um, and, and out of those, Dave's World was the one that stuck around. Yeah, yeah. And that was, uh, that was great fun. Uh, I, I love doing that show. And, and all the people involved were terrific. Was it four seasons, Dave's World? Four, yeah. yeah. What a great ensemble cast and like yeah. perfect in that role as the, the boss. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it was terrific. It, it was well-written. It was smart. Um, really good people. Meshach Taylor became a really close friend. Uh, interestingly, nobody ever did anything um, of, any, of any substance after that. Yeah. To Lane Matthews and J.C. Wendell and, you know, the... Um, the young boy who played uh, the son, um, Zane Carney, mm-hmm. has grown up to be uh, a world-class guitarist. He's extraordinarily talented. And his brother, Reeve Carney, may be the, the, um, the son of John Lennon and, and uh, Freddie Mercury. <laughs> He, he can do anything. He's, wow. He's so talented, it's sick. And I'm surprised he's not one of the top musicians in the world. Listen to some of his music that he, that he wrote, played every instrument on, did all the vocals, uh, produced in his living room wow. on his own. Because you can. Did now. it all. You, because you can. <laughs> yeah. And his attention to detail is phenomenal. There are pieces that sound like there's a gigantic orchestra and chorus um, and his writing is smart. Uh, if any of this stuff had come out, some of it sounds like Queen. Wow. Some of it sounds like John Lennon. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's really special. This whole family uh, are all musicians. And, wow. And, and quite uh, Paris Carney is another one. She's a beautiful singer. And so that acting was like a weird side gig. <laughs> yeah, stuff it's like the something at the time, yeah. Are there, did you ever watch any of the radio, the TV shows set in radio, like KRP or News Radio, or there was always one, and they they were accurate? <laughs> no, WKRP, well, everything that's ever been done about radio has always been wacky. Yeah. It's it's always wacky and kind of goofy and, and um, you know, over the top. I've, I've tried to, I have a, a project that take that I've tried to get off the ground and have been unsuccessful so far called drive time. And it is about radio in 1984 in Los Angeles, the height of the music industry, the height of the radio industry before social media, before all of the diversions, it was the place that provided the landscape of our lives. And it was an amazing time for music because there was so much great music Absolutely. and it was happy. Yeah. It was uplifting, sometimes a little cynical, but overall it was an amazing time uh, for music. And so the landscape is painted Southern California, one of the most beautiful places on earth and all the happiest music in the world. And here's this radio station presenting it all and it's like the forefront it's on in every radio it's on in every cafe and it's on in every car and everywhere you go all over southern california there that station yeah. is and meanwhile behind the scenes are entitled <laughs> smug <laughs> drug dealing backstabbing <laughs> radio personality sounds like radio to me it's exactly what yeah. radio is 
And, you know, and it includes everything. It, it's, you know, it's ruthless backstabbing and drug dealing yeah. and murder. Yeah. I mean, you get... And it all happen. It's Mad Men, basically. I, you know, it's exactly it's right. Yeah. That's, and that's the way we pitch it. What Mad Men did for advertising in the 60s, Drive Time does for radio in the 80s. I always joke that Mad Men is somebody sub bewitched and went, dump the witch and we got a show. Yeah, right. <laughs> Stick to their office. Yeah, I would watch that all day. Every, that's like perfect audience for that yeah yeah I, well i haven't given up on it I, I i've got a lot of projects yeah i um i have uh two with, i'm in partner with a partnership with vin de bona the, the another boston guy yeah another yeah. boston guy and and one of the most successful people in the history of television um um america's funniest videos has been on in prime time for 28 straight years yeah. name another show that's done that uh, none yeah and uh, it's his company, and he's a great guy. And we have these two shows I created together, and they have been, they're at uh, Paramount Network and Pop, and we're meeting with Netflix next week. Oh, cool. And um, we're, he's certain that these things are going to happen. And meanwhile, because, you know, it's this thing that we talk about is that you can't let your mind get away from you right. and go, well, why try anyway? Because <laughs> right. blah, blah, blah. you just work. It's all about action. You have to devote yourself to whatever it is you're passionate about and see what happens. And, you, and the more you work at it, the better you get at it. And the better you get at it, the better the work is. And then you discover new things that are even better. And, and you never know. You can't see the big picture. Yeah. And... Here's an interesting twist. In 1990, I, um, my daughter was six years old and my younger daughter was two. And I woke up say, from a dream saying, button-sided hooey, out loud. <laughs> okay. I, that's the weirdest thing that ever came out of my mouth. <laughs> so I wrote it down and I looked at it written down and I thought, that looks like Dr. Seuss. I should write something, Dr. Seuss, for my daughters. Something that isn't just kind of wacky story, but something of substance. And I had just read, I'd been reading The Wizard of Oz to Amber probably 30 times. We'd get to the end and she'd say, can we start again tomorrow? Oh, okay. And so we, over and over and over again. Wizard, uh, 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 I mean, Alice in Wonderland. Okay. Alice in Wonderland is the weirdest thing anyone has ever written. It's and after strange. all those readings, I still don't understand it. And yet you can follow it and get swept away in the dream world of it. So I decided I would write something that is Alice in Wonderland kind of imagination with the Wizard of Oz, where there's a quest, where there's, there's, it's an allegory, and it has great depth and meaning about life. And I set out to write it, and I wrote every day. And three years later, I had three books. It's, it's huge. And it's all written like Dr. Seuss. It's all written in verse. And it's all fanatical verse. I have this thing about every syllable has to flow in the mouth like pudding. Right. And so it was, you know, where she, she the, little, the first little girl falls into the land of Wahoo. It's an hour sha hourglass shaped world. And she falls into the bottom, and there's a creature called a dabbler. And the dabbler says, We have been waiting and waiting. You know it's a crime to keep dabblers waiting. We haven't the time. There are thoughts to be thunk and deeds to be done. I do this, I do that. I am quite on the run. And he's tapping his toe and drumming his fingers and wondering, Where have you been? We've been waiting for you because everyone in the land of Wahoo is afraid. And you need to find the great Hui. No one knows who he is. This is a mystical being, and yeah. nobody's ever seen him, but they know that he'll have the answer. So this is what the quest is all about. So I write this whole thing, and it's epic. Yeah. And, of course, no book company wants to do it because it's epic. It's a chapter book. It's written in verse. Oh, no, the verse doesn't sell except yeah. by Dr. Seuss. Well, he's dead. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, it's like, uh, Lewis, it's very reminiscent of Lewis Carroll. <laughs> and we wouldn't want to offend Mr. Carroll, would we? I got that. An act, that's an actual quote. You don't want no, Carol Mr. on your Mr. back. Mr. Carroll. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't he's want Carol coming dead. after you. Yeah. I'm sorry, he's dead. Yeah. So nothing ever happened with it. No. 
what I realized was because, and I'd, I'd spent money on doing uh, a demo art and, and I'd taken it to New York and to mm -hmm. Washington, I couldn't get anybody to get into it. So what I needed was a simple little book that's linear, that everybody can follow and understand, and that would pave the way for the button-sided hooey. So I write The Big Galoot, and The Big Galoot uh, is a simple little book, and it's charming, and it's, it's quite wonderful. And I am signed to do uh, by a publishing company, and we do all of the artwork, and it's ready to go to press next week. There's a hostile overthrow of the corporation. Oh. They throw out the president and the CEO. They cancel the children's division, and it takes me 10 years to get the rights to my own book back. Oh. To make a long story short, that never worked out either. As charming as it is, and you can you can get it. I do. I did a wonderful um, book on on uh, iBooks. You can you can buy the uh, with the ver audio version and yep. listen to it. I do a narration with sound effects and everything. It's quite wonderful. But nothing has ever come of it because I couldn't get distribution. I couldn't get anything happening with it. Meanwhile, twenty five years later, my daughter Amber, who is now a successful actress. Yep. She's on that Jared Carmichael show, was it? She's on uh, the Carmichael show. She's on a show called um, uh, Ghosted, oh, now yes, on yeah, Fox. Yeah. And uh, it looks like she may be jumping into another show oh, cool. um, that I can't talk about yet. Yep, but fair enough. <laughs> um, but she's doing well. She's doing very well, yeah. One of her friends is the head of development for a new animated film company that was begun by the, uh, a former executive from DreamWorks. And he's, he remembers me telling the story you know, of all my projects, but what, the one that really resonated with him most was the button-sided hooey. Right. And he said, you know, I could never forget that story because it's so clever, it's so uh, unique. Would you come in and pitch it to our company? Oh, wow. So Amber and I went in together. I did 40 pieces of art to, uh, to present it, and it's really fabulous. And the room, they went crazy for it. They just loved it. And I have an option deal that's being written up today. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... To, to, you never know. You never know. To bring it full circle, I mean, you know, we're talking about you meet a guy in Boston where you work for a year, and a couple of years later, he goes, hey, I thought of you for this thing. You probably haven't thought of that person in forever. And then someone else you worked with, you never know what they're going to do. You write a thing 25 years ago and tell people about it, and someone gets in a position to go, I loved that thing. And you go, I don't, I don't even remember telling you about that thing. Yeah, it's, it's ex exactly right. And and it, and the and the the lesson for us all is that you just never can give up. Yeah, you just have to stay in the pocket. I have I have a friend who's a a um, a writer, and he is critically acclaimed. He's written twenty novels, and he told me that there comes a time, no matter how successful the last novel was, there comes a time when he's writing the new one every single time, when he's certain that he's lost it. He can't write anymore. He doesn't know what he's doing. It's awful. Everything is awful. There's no point in even trying. And he said, and I just sit there and wrench out every word from my doubting, horrified soul. And I sit there and make it happen. <laughs> and then another day goes by. And then a few weeks later, I look back at what I've written over the last few weeks. And the time when I was writing in my most difficult state of mind is some of the best writing I've ever done. Mm -hmm. And the times when I'm full of myself and really confident I got this. is just okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I forget who I heard like, say this, but they said good, good writers throw away what others keep, but they also keep what others throw away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like a very, uh, to have that thing where someone would throw that away and they go, no, I'm going to, I'm going to work on this till it gets right. Yeah. And they really have to put in that time. And it's the same thing. It's, you know, I was just, if you do good work and it's sincere and you try to make the best stuff possible, 
someone might notice, they might not, but at least you you did something good. Yes, you trust can, God and take action. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Like that's yeah. The is, secret is in the action. I'm convinced. Is there anything you watch now? Like, do you? I imagine you watch your daughter when she's in things, or or is that? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I never miss that. In fact, <laughs> I didn't miss uh, the shooting of a single Carmichael show. Um, and loved that show. It was so it was beautifully written. Yeah. My so friend Emily funny. was a writer on that show, Emily Gordon. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It, it, it was a, an amazing team, and it just didn't get the support that it should have had. And uh, yeah, that's why you never know about things. Yeah. You know, even something really good may not happen for whatever reason, and you can't let that crush you. You just have to go, well, what's next? Yeah, we did it the best we could, and we made a good thing. And yeah. it's still there if people want to discover yeah. it. Which is kind of the cool thing now where people can go back and rediscover things. And it's it's not necessarily helpful from a financial standpoint for people, but you know, back when you, know, you make Max Monroe and it's seven episodes and it's gone. It's never going to re-air again. People probably aren't going to see it again. And now with uh, streaming and, the, and Netflix and things like that, these shows that were ended before their time, people can still go back and, and discover. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, they can still enjoy the good work people did, even if it didn't you know, perpetuate, which yeah. is kind of good. Yeah, um, yeah, it totally is good. Um, the, the thing I've discovered I, lately is that you know I've never had a, much of an attention span and a lot of the things i you know when i did shadow vision in 1986 mm -hmm. it was all about that yeah it was we are going to do something that's funny but it's not going to give you time to laugh and it's going to be weird and unexpected and uh hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy at a, a, a thousand miles an hour yeah um but today it is like that and i'm having trouble committing an hour yeah to anything uh, so when i discovered atlanta damn <laughs> it got you it i mean yeah and i only have to like s commit to 30 minutes yeah. and it wildly surprised me it's so original and the and the humor is so weird and it's dark and serious and and inventive and surreal and i watched the first half hour and i watched four that night yeah and the only reason I didn't watch more is because I couldn't get them yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, that's probably my favorite um, discovery this year. I'm late in the game. I, yeah. I kept hearing about it, and it just didn't sound interesting to me. And, and then finally I gave it a chance because everybody raved about it, and I see why. Yeah. And again, it wasn't airing a day and date, so it's not like you missed it and you missed it. You can go back yeah. and you can catch up on it. And yeah. that that's a whole new world. It's that sort of sci-fi world we started talking about at the beginning here where, you know, you, if, if they told you when you were a kid, like on demand, you can watch and watch or listen to anything that's ever been, more or less. Uh, yeah, and you can watch hat. it on your portable device yeah. that you carry in your pocket. Anywhere. What? It's not plugged into anything. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's amazing. And and you know, and also to the point of you're selling this this new show, I, it, it reminds me of sort of the days of the mid '80s where there was this thirst for content, and so there's almost these these uh, arms race among all these different networks yeah. to try and just get yeah, content, yeah. and we we're getting more interesting stuff partly by chance because they're executives and they don't know what people want so they're just like i don't know everything yeah <laughs> but we get some great Let's stuff try that. that comes through and yeah. then who's involved a lot yeah. of it is who's involved which is which is interesting because um it and even that doesn't always work yeah. um, you know you go from black panther which is genius level attention to detail to a wrinkle in time which is ghastly and horrifying it's but like huge you can't, names. You, yeah, huge yeah. names, and and you can't imagine how all those things could go wrong. Yeah. Whether it's cinematography, lighting, sets, uh, special effects, uh, makeup. Oh my God, whose idea was that? <laughs> oh my God, you're watching Oprah with you know RuPaul makeup on, yeah. going. I can't stop thinking that it's Oprah and good God, what is on her face? <laughs> yeah. And it takes you out of the story. And I, 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 there's, there are so many things that are awful about that movie. Uh, I, I don't know how that happened. I mean, sometimes things are. And she's so a really good director. Yeah. Everyone involved is great. The yeah. Source material, like, sometimes stuff's so big that I think they overthink it. 
and like with I think when it gets into the corporate, you know, I have yeah. this sense that that there's a lot of corporate decisions that were imposed on the filmmakers. Yeah. yeah. My and kid loves that drag do. race. Why don't we do the makeup like that? Yeah. <laughs> you watch that That's show right. all the time. <laughs> <laughs> there's some executive who just thinks this thing's going to But something like Black Panther where they think this probably isn't going to do that well, so we're not going to focus too much attention on it. Just go make your movie. Don't go over this budget. Mm. And we'll let you do the thing. And so good. Yeah, and it so come good. up with something amazing. Yeah. And it's uh, it's it's good to know that as much as people complain about us being in sort of a wasteland, sometimes there's a lot of great stuff that still comes out every day. And yeah, it's, it's yeah. almost last too year much was stuff. A, was a really good year for movies. Yeah, I, I, I saw lots of things, but we're now we're in this um, this abyss afterward where nothing new is coming out. Yeah. And we're movie people. We like go to movies all the time. Yeah. You can out and, here. There's amazing things. And you can, yeah. but but they're all the same movies now. Yeah. You know, we've seen every one of them. Yeah. Like it used to be you could have a a small movie, but the stakes are so high that they're like, this has to be a giant spectacle. Yes. It has to be uh, a billion dollar franchise. <laughs> yeah. And it's gotta play on IMAX and you know, and and I wonder if we'll ever get back to being able to do smaller movies. because um, it seems like all the small ones we get are foreign <laughs> yeah well there, there's some exceptions yeah you know, three billboards sick. is yeah. kind of a smaller a smaller movie there there were a few last year that that uh, weren't big budget films that were um um what was the one um about the young girl that's coming of age in sacramento oh ladybird uh, ladybird yeah ladybird that's a small yeah. movie but beautifully made yeah and uh, yeah, so I think there are exceptions to that too. True. So that gets back to the thing: nobody knows anything. <laughs> That's true. You just yeah. have to go and try. Right. <laughs> just know? go and try, and don't give up on it. Yeah. Well, cool. Thank you so much for doing this, and congratulations on the show. I'm looking very much forward to it. Thank you. Uh, and it was been great talking to you. And you too. I enjoyed this. And there you go. That's the shadow, everybody. Uh, your best friend in the void. Uh, not your best friend, period, the shadow. Uh, your friend in the void, uh, Shadow Stevens. I need a really good sign-off. I don't I don't have one at all. Um, so if you have an, a, a sign-off idea, email me at tvguidancecounselor at gmail.com. That sounds like I want you to just email me and be like, hey, well, how will you sign off forever, jerk? Um, you know, don't do that. Uh, I mean, you can, but it'll hurt my feelings. Uh, but if you have a good sign off, let me know. I am not a, I'm not a sign off guy. I've never had a catchphrase. I'm a little bit, um, little bit disappointed by that. But what I'm not disappointed by is my great episode that I have next week. So be sure to be here Wednesday, subscribe to the show, rate, review the show, uh, email me those taglines at tvguidancecounselor at gmail.com or, uh, at, at, uh, TV guidance on Twitter and Instagram, uh, and just search TV guidance counselor on Facebook. If you still using that platform uh and uh yeah we'll see you again next time for a brand new edition of tv guidance council <laughs> as we say in north dakota yes